Good afternoon. Yes, it's working. Good afternoon, everybody. We are with a small amount of people, but uh, I'm sure you are all very eager uh, to participate today, and I'm very happy uh, that you're here today. My name is Hanna van den Bos. I'm a program maker for Studium Generale, and we organize all kinds of lectures like this one. You can also see uh, many of our activities here on the screen. We also have Knight University coming up uh, on the 19th of May, a big science festival that we also organize. Um, and it's also good to know for students from Tilburg University that this um, lecture and also many of our other lectures count towards the Studium Generale certificate for which you can visit five different lectures of ours, then write a small report uh, and then you can get the certificate. More information can be found uh, on our website. Today uh, we have a lecture about match fixing and this is actually part of our uh, ongoing short lecture series, Fixing the Match. Um, it's uh, 45 minutes, around 45 minutes, and then we have hopefully about 50 minutes Q&A for all the questions that you may have. Um, and today the title is Just Tactics or Obvious Manipulation, which actually has to do with the prevalence and uh, moral challenges and also the normalization of uh, match fixing in sports because it is a really difficult question to answer sometimes where um, tactics and, and manipulation begins. And someone who can tell us more about this is Stef van der Hoeven. He is currently doing a PhD at Ghent University in Belgium uh, for the Department of Movement and Sport Sciences. Uh, and he's also part of the Sport Management Research Group. He actually already wrote many interesting articles about the topic of match fixing, mostly on uh, non-betting and uh, sports related match fixing. So please give a big applause to Stef van der Hoeve. Uh, thank you, Hanna, for a, a nice introduction. So as already mentioned, my name is uh, Stef van der Hoeven. I'm a PhD student within the research group of sports management at the Department of Movement and Sports Sciences at Ghent University. And I'm doing research on match fixing. And today I will tell you something more about my recent work on match fixing, which is about the prevalence, moral challenges and normalization of match fixing. So here you can see an overview of today's evening. So first of all, I will give a, a short introduction, which builds further on the previous lecture given uh, by Professor Spapens. Then I will tell you something more about our research on match fixing in Flemish sports and the moral challenges that come with it. Thirdly, uh, I will tell you something more about our Erasmus Plus project EPOSM, in which we examined match fixing in seven European countries, including the Netherlands. Uh, then I will focus on the normalization of match fixing, especially uh, within the unique strategic context of road cycling. And eventually I will end my presentation with some conclusions. So, as already mentioned, uh, during the previous lecture, Professor Spapens talked about match fixing, what it is, its definition, the different types of match fixing. He also explained some cases in the Netherlands and beyond, and he also reviewed some risk factors. Today, I will repeat some of these things so that everything is clear to you, and then I will add some new insights to this. So, match fixing, being in short, the manipulation of sports competitions, is as old as sport itself, and has already occurred in a wide variety of sports and countries. As you can see on the slide, in uh, tennis, football, badminton, basketball, cricket, boxing, and so on. Actually, the slide is way too small to show you all the sports that have already been affected by match fixing. The most widely used uh, definition of match fixing is the one of the Council of Europe, which describes match fixing or the manipulation of sports competitions as an intentional arrangement act or omission aimed at an improper alteration of the result or the course of a sports competition in order to remove all or part of the unpredictable nature of the aforementioned sports competition with a view to obtaining an undue advantage for oneself or for others. So as demonstrated by this definition, 
one of the key difficulties is the broadness of the concept of match fixing. And this can be explained in several ways. First of all, there are different types of match fixing. A distinction is usually made between betting related match fixing and non betting related match fixing. Betting related match fixing aims to make profits on the betting market by betting on the manipulated game. Within this type, a distinction is usually made between betting related match fixing, in which people try to manipulate the specific uh, end result of a match or the outcome of the match and then bet on this. And on the other hand, you have spot fixing, in which people try to manipulate specific elements within a match. For example, um, who gets the first row in, who takes the first yellow card, uh, who wins the first set, and then they bet on this. On the other hand, you have non-betting related match fixing, or in other words, sporting related match fixing. Uh, with sporting related match fixing, the main, um, the primary, uh, it focuses primarily on sporting interests. For example, uh, when people try to fix a match to prevent the relegation of a specific club or team, or just to enable a specific club or team to, win, uh, to become champion. Or another example is when people try to avoid meeting a certain competitor in the next round of a tournament. So in all of these types, also uh, bribery or coercion can be involved. I know an example of non-betting related match fixing is the badminton scandal at the uh, Olympic Games of 2012 in London, where eight badminton players were disqualified from the women's double tournament. Uh, as they try to intentionally lose their match to avoid a, a certain competitor in the next round of the tournament. So the Badminton World Federation um, disqualified these athletes on the ground that they broke uh, the code of conduct of the Badminton Federation, which states that they always have to perform at their best and try to pursue victory. An additional argument uh, was that their behavior was very detrimental and abusive for the sport. So this example is actually um, the first, uh, the biggest example of a mass disqualification and the first example uh, of a, a disqualification of multiple athletes from multiple countries for match fixing in the 21st century on the Olympic Games. An example of uh, betting related match fixing um, is the ZNJ case, which took place in uh, Belgium in 2004-2005. Zheng Ye was a so-called Chinese businessman who infiltrated in several professional football clubs and bribed and coerced people into fixing, so athletes and coaches, so he could earn money by betting on the manipulated games through the uh, Asian illegal betting market. An example of spot fixing is the case of Matt Letizier. Matt Letizier was a former professional footballer of Southampton, and in his autobiography, he confessed that he was involved in an attempt to spot fix. More specifically, uh, during a game uh, in 1995 against Wimbledon, he and some friends uh, had bet money on the fact that the first throw in would take place during the first minute. So as planned, uh, Matt Letizier received the ball immediately after the kickoff and he tried to kick the ball out of play. Unfortunately for him, the winger of his team was not aware of this and he kept the ball in play. So their attempt to spot fix did not succeed. So these are some examples. So just for the sake of clarity, I would like to mention that when I speak about sporting related match fixing, I actually mean non-betting related match fixing. These are synonyms that are often used interchangeably in the literature and also throughout my, my uh, presentation. So now I will tell you something more about match fixing in Flemish sports and the moral challenges that come with it. So during the previous lecture, uh, Professor uh, Spapens discussed the, the research he did together with Professor Olfers in the Netherlands on match fixing. And they found that 8% of their respondents indicated that they knew someone who had been approached for match fixing. Additionally, they saw that 4% indicated that they had already been approached personally for match fixing. And moreover, the majority of their cases were sporting related. Now, following these interesting results, we also got the idea to examine the prevalence of match fixing in Flemish sports, more specifically in Flemish football, tennis, and badminton. And additionally, uh, we also would like to examine uh, how match fixing related to the moral decision-making process of the people who are approached for match fixing. So what did we do? We conducted an online questionnaire based, uh, so an online questionnaire on match fixing based on the study of Spapens and Offers, 
and added elements to examine spot fixing and the model of rest, which I will explain to you in a few minutes. We disseminated the questionnaire through Facebook and email, and additionally, we also visited some clubs and tournaments with tablets to recruit respondents. In total, we reached a sample of 567 adult members uh, who were affiliated with the Flemish Sports Federations of Football, Tennis or Badminton. So what did our results show? Uh, regarding the prevalence of match fixing, we saw that 101 respondents indicated that they knew someone who had been approached for match fixing. So this equals 17.8%. On the other hand, 36 respondents indicated that they had been approached themselves for match fixing. And moreover, of these 36 cases, 33 cases were non-betting related and three cases were betting related. So these results clearly show that non-betting related match fixing occurs significantly more in Flemish sports than betting related match fixing. The second part of our results related to the moral decision-making process of the people uh, who are approached for match fixing, and therefore we use the model of rest. The model of rest consists of four steps. Um, more specifically, uh, the first step, moral sensitivity, which refers uh, to the ability of an individual to recognize that the situation contains a moral issue. The second step, moral judgment, refers to the evaluation of the moral justification of the different solutions uh, to the moral issue. So in other words, during the second step, moral judgment, an individual will decide whether his or her moral action is morally right or wrong. In a third step, moral motivation, um, the, the moral solution um, refers to the intention to choose the moral solution over other solutions. So for example, financial gain. The fourth step, moral character, involves courage and determination to follow through with the moral action despite um, external threats or pressure, for example. So what did our results show? Our results showed that people who are approached for a non-betting related match fixing proposal frequently consented to the proposal because they don't see match fixing as an ethical issue, which is the first step of the process or even if they see match fixing as an ethical issue, they don't judge it, judge it as morally wrong, which is the second step of the process. Uh, for example, uh, they saw it as a friendly gesture towards another club or athlete, or some of them stated uh, that they don't see the problem to um, uh, lose a set and eventually win the match. On the other hand, we saw that people who were approached for a betting related match fixing proposal know that it is an ethical issue that it is morally wrong, but they um, consented to the proposal because of other inducements, like for example, financial gain, which is a third step. Um, or people, uh, others who were approached for betting related match fixing consented because of external threats or pressures, which is the fourth step. So our results show that the, the different steps of the moral thrust were um, uh, linked to uh, both types of match fixing. So our results showed that both types of match fixing are clearly different diseases that, that ask for different remedies. So based on this, um, we would state that to prevent non-betting related match fixing, um, awareness raising initiatives are necessary or an ethical code on match fixing and so on. Whereas for betting related match fixing, trustworthy uh, whistleblowing protection programs are more appropriate. So if you would like to know something more about this, then you can read our uh, research online. Uh, you can visit the, the paper through this uh, QR code. So after these interesting results in Flanders, we got the idea to expand this research on a broader international scale. And therefore, um, we elaborated the Erasmus Plus Sport Project EPOSM, which stands for Evidence-Based Prevention of Sporting-Related Match Fixing. And this project went from January 2020 until December 2021, so it recently ended. And this project was co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. So our project team consisted of uh, 10 project partners, where we as Ghent University uh, were uh, the coordinator. And for example, for the Netherlands, our academic partner was Utrecht University, and our practical partner was Foundation CSCF. Our project had three main objectives. First of all, raising awareness about the prevalence of sporting-related match fixing. 
stimulating moral judgment regarding the fact that sporting-related match-fixing is wrong, and sharing and transferring this knowledge on sporting-related match-fixing. So we try to do this in three parts. So in the first academic part, we um, conducted an online questionnaire on match-fixing in seven countries. Then in the second part, we elaborated uh, action plans uh, against match-fixing and workshops on match-fixing. And in the third part, we further disseminated our results and outputs of the project. So regarding the online questionnaire, we conducted an online questionnaire on match fixing in Austria, Belgium, Croatia, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and United Kingdom. In each country, we focused on three sports disciplines, mainly football and tennis. And then according to the national preferences, we added uh, a third sport. So for example, in Belgium, we focused on football, tennis, and basketball, whereas in the Netherlands, we focused on football, tennis, and hockey. Our target groups were respondents of 18 years uh, or older uh, who are or were involved in the selected sport disciplines per country. So uh, we really tried to reach a various uh, range of sport actors, so current and former athletes, coaches, board members, referees, medical staff, and so on. Eventually, we reached a total sample of 5,014 respondents across the seven countries. Of these uh, 5,014 respondents, 17.5% of them indicated that they personally knew one or more persons who had been approached to fix. Additionally, 8.4% of them indicated that they had already been approached themselves for match fixing. So if we count uh, these both percentages together, so 17.5 plus 8.4%, then we have approximately 26%. However, between both groups, there was an overlap of um, approximately 6%. So there was 6% uh, of the sample who indicated that they had already been approached themselves for match fixing and that they knew someone else who had also been approached for match fixing. So if we, um, if we do 26% minus the 6% overlap, we have nearly 20% of the people in sports that has been confronted with direct or indirect match fixing proposals. So if we have a closer look at the people who indicated that they had been approached themselves for match fixing, uh, then we saw that um, the last or only match fixing proposal they received had only a sporting related purpose in 68% uh, of the cases, and it had only a betting related purpose in 9.8% of the cases. So again, our figures show that sporting related match fixing occurs significantly more than betting related match fixing. Uh, however, I can hear you think, where are the other 22.2%? Well, the other respondents indicated uh, that they were approached for another motive without specification, or they indicated uh, a combination of motives. For example, some of the respondents indicated that the last or only match-fixing proposal they received had a sporting-related purpose and a betting-related purpose at the same time. So, for example, it can happen that someone wants to fix a match to prevent the relegation of a team, and then uses this information to earn money on the betting market as well. So this is an important finding that shows that both types of match fixing don't have to be separated. They can also uh, happen on the same time. And additionally, there were some respondents who indicated that they, not know, uh, that they did not know what the motive was of the proposal they received. So as mentioned, um, in our project, we also examined match fixing in the Netherlands. And now I will give you a quick look at some figures for the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, we uh, reached a total sample of, of 1,039 respondents in hockey, tennis, and football. However, for our analysis, we only focused uh, of the sample in hockey and tennis, uh, because uh, for these two samples, we were uh, able uh, to use the member panels of the Hockey Federation and the Tennis Federation in the Netherlands. For example, for the Hockey Federation, we sent our questionnaire to uh, 3,097 members of their member panel, and we got an answer from 545 of them. In tennis, we sent our questionnaire to uh, 4,400 uh, panel members of the Tennis Federation, and we received an answer of 420 of them. In football, uh, this methodology was not possible, um, and therefore we tried to reach respondents through social media, but we only reached a small sample and therefore we decided to exclude them from the analysis. 
So in this sample, we saw that 12% knew someone who had been approached for match fixing. This percentage was slightly higher in hockey than in tennis. And on the other hand, we saw that 7% indicated that they had been approached themselves for match fixing. Um, what was surprising is that all of these cases were sporting related. Um, as we uh, look at the research of Spapens and Offers, uh, they indicated that 20% of the cases were betting related. Um, but uh, if we have a closer look at their research, we saw that they mainly reached um, football players on a high level and the highest level. So the chance that betting related match fixing would be um, reported in their research was also higher than with, with our research, as we tried to reach really all levels from the lowest to the highest. So these are some figures for the Netherlands. If you would like to know something more about our EPOSM project, or specifically uh, about the, the, the figures for the Netherlands, then you can check our website where um, result reports are present uh, for the different countries. And on the website of Utrecht University, there is also a Dutch version of the um, result report for the Netherlands. Additionally, we also have some social media pages where uh, developments of the project were posted. So, although the previous uh, mentioned prevalence figures are very valuable, there are still other difficulties to the concept of match fixing. One of them is the question, when do we speak about match fixing? Where do proper tactics end and when does manipulation begin? Why is it possible that certain behavior can be seen as tactics in one sport while it is considered corruption in another sport? To answer these questions, we examined the gray zone between tactics and manipulation in road cycling. Now, um, why did we choose road cycling? Because match fixing has hardly been investigated in road cycling, despite some well-known incidents. For example, uh, former cyclist Alexander Vinokurov, which is on the, the left photo, um, was accused of um, buying his 2010 uh, Bastogne liege victory from the Russian rider um, Kolobnev. Um, one year after his victory, uh, a Swiss magazine uh, revealed emails between both cyclists where an agreement was made uh, about uh, 150,000 euros. However, uh, nine year, years later, both cyclists were cleared of corruption, so in 2019, due to a lack of evidence. Uh, two years after his first controversial victory, uh, Alexander Vinokurov was again discredited in 2012 after his controversial victory during the uh, London Olympic road cycling race. So despite these well-known incidents, match fixing has barely been investigated in road cycling. Uh, additionally, road cycling is characterized by a unique strategic context as cyclists have to cooperate with their competitors to have success. Moreover, the cooperation between competitors assumes various forms, ranging from whole teams working together in the peloton to cyclists sharing the burden in a breakaway. So it is unclear where um, permitted cooperation ends and prohibited cooperation starts. Moreover, uh, the world governing body of cycling, the Union Cycliste Internationale, or in short UCI, states that uh, riders shall sportingly defend their own chances any collusion or behavior likely to falsify or go against the interest of the competition shall be forbidden. Although the UCI's upper and black and white rule implies that any form of cooperation or collusion is actually forbidden, they do not define where proper tactics end and improper alterations start. As such, the boundaries between acceptable behavior and misconduct remain unclear, causing a gray zone. And this gray zone and road cycling's culture of agreement can be explained by the peculiarities of road cycling. A first peculiarity is the fact that road cycling is an individual sport practiced in teams, a so-called hybrid sport. Cycling races are organized as team events, but it is always one cyclist who, win, who wins the race. Additionally, road cycling is practiced on public roads with air resistance as the primary external factor and therefore the technique of drafting, which means riding so close behind another cyclist that the air resistance is significantly reduced, forms the main foundation of tactics in road cycling. By drafting another cyclist on a flat road, a cyclist can save up to 30-40% of energy. A third uh, feature is that road cycling uh, is, is characterized by hierarchical structures, both within a team and between teams. 
Within a team, a hierarchical distinction is usually made between team captains, who are expected to garner the team's results, and helpers, or in other terms, domestics, whose only role is to support the team captains during the race. As such, there is an inherent tension between individualism and collectivism in road cycling teams. This tension is also present between teams as well, as the UCI makes a hierarchical distinction between UCI uh, world teams, pro teams, and continental teams. However, it happens that cyclists of the different team levels often compete against each other in the same peloton. So that's why we frequently see that the big, te the big teams uh, dominate races. But of course, agreements between cyclists of the different levels uh, are also made. Uh, fourthly, um, as cycling teams almost completely depend on their main sponsors, the contract durations are rather short. And therefore, the job insecurity and the pressure to deliver results is quite high. Fifthly, um, the prize money in road cycling is usually shared with all team members, including the technical staff. This mechanism is used to stimulate cooperation within a team. Um, however, this, this could also lead to a tendency uh, to ignore the team tactics and, for example, sell a race so an individual cyclist could earn more money. And lastly, the cycling peloton has often been compared uh, to a family in which uh, each cyclist must adhere to tacit or unwritten rules. However, this uh, close-knit community has already shown uh, to facilitate illicit activities, like, for example, doping use, as we think on the, the Armstrong case, while complexifying its detection and prosecution. Moreover, several authors have shown that uh, cyclists were ostracized or even pushed out of cycling when they try to denounce, denounce um, corruption cases. So, although the peculiarities of road cycling may explain road cycling's culture of agreements, they also emphasize the grey zone. Although the various forms of cooperation clearly differ in terms of questionability and improperness, they are all implicit, implicitly contrary to the UCI rule. So we state that behavior that could perhaps be seen as corruption is actually considered normal in road cycling. So to examine this, we use the theoretical framework of Ashford and Anand about the normalization of corruption in organizations, which states that three pillars contribute to the normalization of corruption. More specifically, the first pillar institutionalization refers to the process by which corrupt practices are enacted as a matter of routine, often without conscious thought about their property. The second pillar, rationalization, refers uh, to the process by which individuals who engage in corrupt acts use self-serving ideologies to justify the acts in their own eyes. And the third pillar, socialization, refers to the process by which newcomers are taught to perform and accept the corrupt practices. So these three pillars are mutually reinforcing and interdependent and contribute to the normalization of corruption. So following all, the, all of this information, we had two research questions. The first one was, how do road cyclists perceive the existence of match fixing in their sport? And the second one was, based on a theoretical framework, how is match fixing institutionalized, rationalized and socialized in road cycling? So to examine this, we uh, try to interview cyclists. So we first had a short list of cyclists uh, we would like to interview. Then we contacted them, and if we, uh, someone agreed, we also asked them to suggest other cyclists who could, uh, could give their perspective on the subject. Eventually, uh, we interviewed 15 road cyclists. Um, all of them were male, four were female. They were of different ages and involved on different levels. For example, on the highest amateur level, elite without contract, to the continental level, to even the highest level in cycling, which is the World Tour level. So what did our results show? Our results uh, show that road cyclists have a different understanding of match fixing. Cyclists generally explained their perception of match fixing meant deciding before the race what will happen during the race. So given their belief that they did not predetermine competition outcomes, they were convinced that match fixing does not occur in road cycling. Moreover, when it comes to bootmakers and online betting, they did not saw this as a threat to their sport. Uh, when, when I talk about bookmakers, I really mean bookies who are physically present along the roadside and who write down the odds on a chalkboard. 
So these kind of bookies were also seen as a, a part of the tradition and folklore of the sport, even despite past incidents with them. Uh, on the other hand, the cyclists clearly distinguished the cooperation concept. Um, they stated that cooperation was an inherent tactical part of road cycling and does not match fixing. On the other hand, um, they acknowledged that buying and selling races uh, was not uncommon in their sport, mainly at lower levels of competition. Uh, and although mixed feelings were present, uh, they uh, didn't see this as match fixing as well. Uh, for example, they stated that uh, you have to be in the decisive breakaway before you get that chance. So some of them state that um, cyclists at the back of the peloton will not come in the position to buy or sell a race. So you first have to deserve it to be in that position to buy or sell a race. So, so they also didn't see this as match fixing. So albeit uh, our um, results showed that cyclists have a different perception of match fixing compared to the definition of the Council of Europe. Our results further showed that uh, different forms of cooperation were normalized in road cycling. So regarding the institutionalization pillar, we saw that cyclists uh, initially decide to uh, cooperate with competitors for tactical reasons, out of friendship, for example, with uh, training partners of other teams. From a reciprocal perspective, so for example, I help you today, you help me tomorrow. Or from a rational choice perspective, so where a cost-benefit al analysis is made, this is more linked to buying and selling races. And this all happened in a climate where ethics are quickly pushed aside. So in a second phase, we saw that cooperation became embedded in cycling structures and processes, which could be seen in the many unwritten rules that exist in the cycling peloton. An example of an unwritten rule uh, is that it is, it is uh, not allowed to attack when an opponent um, is doing a sanitary stop. Or for example, in a stage race, when an, uh, a general classification rider is in uh, the decisive breakaway with a helper from another team and they stay in front until the finish, then it's actually an unwritten rule that the general classification rider should give the stage victory to the helper. So these kind of unwritten rules were uh, very prevalent in the cycling peloton. And so we could um, see that the peloton was actually a kind of subculture which insulates the cyclists from the wider culture with its own norms, values, and where cooperation uh, was normalized. So in a third phase, we saw that cooperation became routinized and habitual in um, road cycling. Um, when we asked the cyclists uh, about um, routinized fixing, they almost immediately pointed to the Postur de France criteriums. These are uh, a kind of uh, exhibition races that are organized shortly after the Tour de France in towns in Flanders and also in the Netherlands. And they found it um, very normal that um, the result of these criteriums were predetermined as these criteriums um, have commercial purposes and serve to entertain the people. So they, they found this normal. Regarding the rationalization pillar, uh, we could identify the eight rationalizing strategies as listed by Ashworth and Anand. For example, cyclists frequently used selective comparison justifications to state that match fixing is a much bigger problem in football than in road cycling. So in this way, they try to justify their own behavior and minimize the fact that it could also happen in their sport. Or they refocused attention. For example, when we were talking about um, the post to the France criteriums, they also sometimes stated that these criteriums were fixed for their own safety because after three weeks of Tour de France, they are very exhausted. And so for their own safety, uh, uh, the race was fixed. However, by, uh, by using this rationalization, they tried to refocus the attention from the fact that the race was fixed to a non-stigmatized fact, their safety. Or they denied their responsibility by stating that everyone uh, does it or in that particular situation, I had no other choice than to sell the race, or they, uh, they didn't see their behavior as something wrong, and so on. So many rationalizations were used to justify their cooperative behavior. Regarding the socialization pillar, uh, we could identify the mechanism of incrementalism. As we saw that cyclists gradually evolve uh, their attitudes towards cooperative behavior throughout their career. 
the, the longer they are in the peloton, uh, the, gather, uh, the better they get to know the other cyclists and the strong and cooperative cyclists, and so their attitude towards cooperation evolves throughout their career. On the other hand, we saw that cyclists uh, also frequently compromised to avoid uh, problems and social sanctions of other cyclists. Uh, for example, some of them stated that it is not done uh, to break um, an agreement uh, or to refuse an agreement because this could, could lead to social sanctions in the current race, but also in future races. So if you break an agreement in one race, it could happen that in the, the next five races, they will ride against you. So these two mechanisms uh, were sometimes supplemented by the mechanism of cooptation, which means that si um, newcomers were induced by rewards, for example, money. However, we clearly saw that this mechanism of cooptation was subordinate to the reciprocal nature of agreements. So by showing how cooperation is normalized in road cycling, this study clearly challenged the concept of match fixing. Moreover, it showed that match fixing should not be considered in a black or white way. Um, although road cycling's culture of agreements may theoretically Im imply match fixing, we see that it is considered normal and inherent by the cyclists. As such, we may also wonder whether we are authorized to label this behavior as match fixing. Um, additionally, we also clearly saw that the normalization process is at the, is at the, gray, um, is at the root of the gray zone we perceived in road cycling. So if you would like to know something more about this study, then you can find the original research article online, also via this um, QR code. So then I would like to end my presentation with some conclusions. So building on the figures I showed you today, um, we can conclude that sporting related match fixing occurs significantly more than betting related match fixing. And following this, I would advocate that sporting related match fixing should be given a more prominent place in sport corruption research and prevention initiatives because until today, um, research and uh, initiatives mainly focused on betting related match fixing. Uh, additionally, our um, study in uh, cycling um, clearly showed that match fixing or behavior that could perhaps be seen as match fixing can become embedded, perpetuated and disnormalized in sports. Now, following all of this, so based on the figures uh, who show that, um, which show that sporting related match fixing occurs significantly more, that it is in fact more common and accepted and that it is actually easier to rationalize and socialize sporting related match fixing because it is frequently seen as tactics and not as corruption. I would argue that sporting related match fixing is more normalized or at least is more vulnerable to the normalization process than betting related match fixing. So this does not mean that betting related match fixing uh, cannot be uh, normalized. Um, certainly in countries or areas where um, corruption is more widespread, it is also possible that betting related match fixing is normalized. So, and before I end my presentation, I would like to end with a small promotion talk. So uh, during August of this year, a new book on match fixing will be released uh, with the title, Understanding Match Fixing in Sport Theory and Practice. This book was edited by a colleague of mine and I also um, added or, or contributed a chapter to this book in which I explain some of the insights I showed you today. So if you are interested in match fixing, certainly check our forthcoming work. Thanks for your attention. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, are there any questions maybe? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question about the, I think it was one of the last studies on cycling where you interviewed, I think, 14 respondents? Um, 15. 15, okay. Um, and you mentioned only four of them were women. So I was wondering uh, how you got uh, these respondents. Like what, you mentioned the procedure that they would mention another name. And I was wondering why do you think it was so, there were so few women in the pool and what was the consequence in the results? Yeah, so first we had a short list of women and men we would like to interview. So involved on the different levels, as we clearly saw that uh, the, uh, the hierarchical structures within cycling, so uh, continental level, uh, pro team level and uh, world tour level. But 
uh, with this kind of research, it is not evident to, uh, to find people. So we, um, we contacted the different people on our shortlist. Um, and when someone agreed, um, then we interviewed them and we also asked them to um, suggest other people who are interesting for our research. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we were not able to recruit uh, an, an equal number of uh, female cyclists um, than um, male cyclists. But um, in the end, uh, we stopped the data collection as, as we saw uh, data saturation. So as we saw that um, the answers frequently returned. So, um, we kept recruiting uh, respondents and after 15 respondents, we saw that um, several things uh, were repeated in their answers. So, and then we decided to stop the data collection and, uh, yeah, and then we analyzed this, uh, this sample. All right, any, uh, any other questions maybe? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, where exactly does the moral relevance uh, for sports, uh, the, the, the non-betting uh, area then at least, I understand that with betting you're essentially just stealing money from people in a way, so that, that, that that's clear, but uh, for me at least when I think of sports, the main, uh, yeah, the, the main point of sports would be the, to simply entertainment, essentially. Uh, and as long as the public isn't aware of uh, match ma matchmaking, uh, I, does that really affect it? And if not, then where does it uh, derive its moral uh, uh, relevance from? Well, actually, any kind of match fixing is a breach of fair play. And fair play is, is the basic of sport, that you should always pursue victory and try to win. So. Um, regarding sporting related match fixing, if anyone uh, sees it, you can, uh, it's still a problem. It's still against the spirit of sport to pursue victory. And that's where it all starts. So that is um, yeah, actually uh, a breach of uh, the basic principles of sport. And, and so we clearly saw that regarding sporting related match fixing, they frequently didn't see, uh, didn't see it as an ethical issue or didn't see it as a problem frequently as a, a friendly gesture, certainly on, on lower levels. I don't know if this uh, answers your question. Um, yeah, it, it just like uh, responding, it also makes me think of a question of uh, curious to think what you think about it. Um, like usually, or there's this critique nowadays coming up that there's also, um, you know, it's not in sports only about your physique or that you're really talented, but there's also lots of money, uh, you know, like getting into sports. And when you basically pay enough money, you can reach a top level or you at, at least have an advantage over others who cannot pay that amount of money. Um, so, you know, match fixing is of course a, a big problem or one of those problems, but what do you think of like fair play in sports as general and do you see it also um yeah as as a problem that is affecting sports nowadays of what do you think of that idea of fair play uh, yeah fair play you know. and um you know like all those issues that we are now facing when big amounts of money coming in but also match fixing and i'm also really curious how you think we could prevent it maybe yeah, f for prevention, as I mentioned during my presentation, we can focus on education, so to raise awareness. Uh, but of course, we may not only focus uh, on the fact that uh, match fixing is only an individual problem. Um, in our research, we sometimes speak about the micro, meso and macro level. So you have on the micro level, the individual. And then of course, it's easy to state from, yeah, it's, a, it's the fault of the individual. But on the meso level, you also have the uh, organization and the culture in the organization that is responsible for the behavior within the organization. And on a, a macro level, you have also the rules. So uh, you can focus on education on an individual level and awareness raising, but uh, also the, yeah, the rules and uh, the organizations, the federations involved should also work on the prevention of it. All right, thank you. Any other question? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk, first of all. Um, I thought you said that uh, fair play is trying to win every match, and by trying to win every match, you don't participate in match fixing, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, basically. Basically, yeah. Sure. Uh, let's say in a tournament where you want to win the cup rather than, well, you might want to win uh, every match in order to win the cup, but like in the World Cup 2018, where Belgium where it was the case that Belgium had to finish second to yeah. avoid any tougher competitors, right? Uh, would you say that in that case, when a team uh, plays with, uh, well within their own capabilities, in order to try and win the competition, is in fact match fixing or not? Uh, yes, in fact, in each game you should play at your uh, best abilities. Um, but I think you were mentioning the, the match against uh, England. Uh, in the so, um, yeah, also the difficulty regarding this is yeah, to prove it. Um, you should play at, um, to, to win the game. Uh, but of course, if they, uh, they try to lose or, or draw the game, um, then if the intention is to fix the match, then it's actually match fixing. But if everyone says, yeah, we, play, we did our best, there was no agreement or it can, can be proved, then you have no evidence to show that it is match fixing. And that is actually what uh, can be linked to the gray zone I showed you today, that uh, certainly around sporting related match fixing, uh, for, uh, someone can say that uh, there are tactics at a certain moment, whereas others will say it's match fixing. And there in, in that gray area, it's not clear where we should draw the line which is uh, fault and, and what is not um, yeah, fault. Uh, early on, you mentioned the example of a badminton team being disqualified. Do you know how it was determined that that was match fixing? Um, yeah. Th the the important thing about this was that it was about four uh, duos and uh, they played right after each other. So they all, uh, the four duos tried to intentionally lose the match. So the first match in the group stage was of a very bad level. You can also check uh, these uh, matches on YouTube and you will see that they played very, very bad. And so uh, the spectators had paid um, an expensive ticket, want to see uh, top badminton, and then uh, they, they saw an, yeah, a strange game and uh, the whole crowd was booing. So that was, all, um, an, uh, that was already uh, a feature that it was not right. Then the, the referee even stopped the game and warned them to improve uh, their, their game because it was so bad. And then one hour after that first game, the second game was exactly the same. So <laughs> the, the spectators even got more mad. And then uh, the day after, the Badminton World Federation decided, based on their uh, code of conduct, that they had to be disqualified because it was, yeah, uh, it was a disaster uh, for the sport what happened the day before. So that was also the first time that, uh, yeah, based on an, um, a code of conduct, that uh, athletes were uh, disqualified. All right. Any other questions? Then uh, I think we finish here. Thank you very much again, uh, Steph, okay. for uh, giving this lecture today. Um, we, it's also good to know that next week, next week on Thursday, we have our last lecture in this series by Sandra Meuse. She's a, a sports uh, philosopher, also giving a talk about this topic. And um, yeah, for today, I found it really interesting also that in your research, you really looked at the corruption uh, model in organizations and that you really applied it to, um, yeah, to match fixing basically. It's interesting to see those parallels and um, what actually comes out of it. And it also really makes me think, oh, it's even more difficult now um, to really, yeah, there's this big gray zone and to really detect or see what is match fixing and what it is not. It's not black and white, as you said. So thank you very much. And uh, again, please give a big uh, applause for Steph. Thank you.